It was wrong. The extramarital part was very wrong. What kind of odyssey helped turn a daughter of a champion of family values into a symbol of a culture out of control? He became the poster boy for hypocrites, and his family suffered terribly for it. In this hour, the facts behind the headline-making life of Mary Kay Letourneau. This is Headliners and Legends with Matt Lauer. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Headliners and Legends. You know the headline, a 34-year-old wife and mother of four conceives a child with a 13-year-old boy. She calls it love. The courts call it rape. And though this saga became known in 1997, people are still talking about it, still trying to come to grips with the questions. Why? What was Mary Kay Letourneau thinking? And how did her life ever get so far off track? Mary, how do you feel? On November 14, 1997, Mary Kay Letourneau, wife, mother, and beloved elementary school teacher, faces seven and a half years in prison for the rape of her sixth grade student. Please help me. Help us. Help us all. Her tears and words express remorse. But in truth, Mary Kay believes that her sexual relationship with the 13-year-old boy, the father of her fifth child, is love. I felt that I very much needed the relationship. I also felt that he needed the relationship. She loses her family, her job, but her desires are uncontrollable, and it happens all over again. She has authorized me to confirm that she is, in fact, pregnant. What brought her to this? Lost under the torrent of sensational headlines is the story of Mary Kay Letourneau's tortured family history. Mary is the result of a complex and troubled childhood, I think. Uh, blame is relative. Both personal tragedy and public humiliation had visited her decades ago. Her father, then a nationally known politician, disgraced the family name by having an affair with a student. How much do the recent headlines mirror a painful past? The story begins in Southern California, where Mary Kay Schmitz is born on January 30th, 1962. Her father, John Schmitz, is a charismatic college instructor who teaches philosophy and anti-communism. Her mother, Mary, gives up a promising career as a chemist to raise their growing family. Though John and Mary have three sons, Mary Kay is their first daughter, and she immediately becomes the apple of her father's eye. He seemed instantly to dote on her as if this was the child he had been waiting for. John Schmitz is a member of the John Birch Society, a right-wing political organization that is fiercely anti-communist. In 1964, he wins a seat in the California State Senate, where for six years he works tirelessly on behalf of his ultra-conservative agenda. His core issue is family values, and he holds up his own family life as the standard for these beliefs. He was the father of family values. He espoused them in every speech he ever made, and personally and privately. He always talked about the family, about his lovely children. I can remember Mary as a very little girl, very pretty, uh, but in addition to that, just absolutely adored and worshipped her father. In 1970, John wins a special election to Congress and moves with his growing family, now numbering seven children, to Washington, D.C. Nine-year-old Mary Kay lives the privileged life of a congressman's child, joining Easter egg rolls on the White House lawn, while basking in the glow of her father's political prominence. All of it, of course, was centered around her father and the people that he was attracting, which I think, you know, made him even bigger in her eyes. Mary Kay's mother shares her husband's political beliefs and is right by his side during his campaigns. But one big difference between the couple is their relationship with Mary Kay. Mother Mary is distant and unapproachable. Mary's mother, as opposed to her father, was a person whose rigidity never, ever bent. 
she was a person who had very distinct ideas about how all children should be, and a daughter in particular. In 1972, 10-year-old Mary Kay is dazzled by her father's bid for the presidency. He runs on the far right-wing American party ticket. His platform? To completely overhaul and in some cases eliminate all social services. Those who work ought to live better than those who won't. It's as simple as that. Mary loved the idea, I think, that he would be this kind of noble knight in pursuit of a great cause. If there were flags to wave for him, she would wave them. If there were things to cheer about, she would cheer. But Schmitz is very much a fringe candidate. He wins only one million votes, mainly from his home state. However, to Mary Kay, he remains larger than life. After the election, the family returns to California, where John resumes teaching and plans his next run for public office. They move into a house in the exclusive Corona Del Mar neighborhood of Spyglass Hill. The home is used as a showpiece to entertain important friends. But on August 13, 1973, the Schmitz family's picture-perfect world is shattered. Her brother, Philip, was just a toddler. And one day, you know, Mary and her brother and Philip were playing by the pool. The mom went inside uh, to take care of business. When 11-year-old Mary Kay takes her eyes off of her baby brother, Philip, the toddler wanders into the pool and begins to sink. When Philip is finally found, paramedics rush to the scene. A frightened Mary Kay watches as they try to revive him, but it is too late. It was just one horrible, horrible family tragedy. The grief was enormous. The family is devastated, but Mary Kay is assured that she's not to blame. She's always said, I've never felt responsible for that drowning. I've never felt that was my fault. But if you're there, and you're a part of it in some way, you know, just a witness to it, um, I think it would mark you for the rest of your life. And I think it did, Mary did carry that kind of burden. Baby Phillip's drowning is the first blow to Mary Kay's happy childhood. Coming up, a shocking public scandal tears Mary Kay's family apart. Does the baby have a name? For Mary Kay Schmitz, the child who will become Mary Kay Latourno, the 1973 drowning of her little brother is a personal and family trauma. But by high school, Mary Kay appears to be like most other sunny California girls. She exemplified everything that young, beautiful women in California are supposed to exemplify. She was very attractive. Mary Kay attends Cornelia Connolly, a Catholic preparatory school for girls in Anaheim. She's bright but she feels no pressure to excel. Her dad's motto was always, take the B. You know, don't work so hard to struggle to get that A. You know, take the B. And Mary pretty much lived that life. Where Mary Kay shines is on the social scene. She's a cheerleader and a beauty contestant. She seems to enjoy the attention she gets from boys. And while her parents are out campaigning, paying more attention to their political lives than to her, Mary Kay spends her time partying with her friends. She would put the makeup on, get the hair done, get herself all dolled up, and she and her friend would head down to USC, hang out with the frat boys. Mary Kay graduates high school in 1980, anticipating only that her future will hold exactly what is expected. She will marry well and raise a family. So she bides her time taking classes at Orange Coast College while she lives with her parents on Spyglass Hill. But in 1982, the family calm is rocked by scandal. This is the woman State Senator John Schmidt says is the mother of his eighth child, a 13-month-old boy. Mary Kay's father, John Schmidt, the right-wing California state senator and longtime champion of family values, has been cheating on his wife. Does the baby have a name? Schmidt has been having a nine-year affair with a former student named Carla Stuckel and he acknowledges fathering two children with her. Here was this man leading the charge of 
good conservatism, and it turns out that he is absolutely living and has been living for years this terrific, tremendous lie. He became the poster boy for hypocrites, and uh, his family suffered terribly for it. The Schmitz's image as the perfect traditional family is in shambles. John's career is ruined. Disgraced politically and socially, he's forced to sell the house on Spyglass Hill. People just dumped him right and left as soon as the scandal broke. John moves alone to a nearby trailer park and continues to teach, waiting for his pension. His wife Mary takes the youngest children and moves back to Washington, D.C., where she has a close circle of friends. There was some sadness for Mary in wondering how she was going to handle it all. There were lots of predictions that she would divorce John, but she, uh, she didn't. While her parents work long distance to repair their broken marriage, 20-year-old Mary Kay leaves California to attend Arizona State University. She picks up where she left off in high school, spending most of her time partying. Among the young men she casually dates is Steve Latorno. Mary Kay never thinks of Steve as marriage material, only as someone to have fun with. He was not politically savvy, not um, politically ambitious, not quite daddy. When she and her best friend were little girls and dreaming of that right guy, the picture wasn't Steve Letourneau. They soon realize that they have little in common, but not before Mary Kay becomes pregnant. According to her friends, although Steve is not the man anyone imagined for Mary Kay, her parents, now back together, leave her no options. They insisted, her father foremost, that she had to get married to this young man. And she did. It was sort of a marriage under duress. They didn't want to give her a chance to just have the baby and try to figure out what to do with her life and they certainly wouldn't have gone for an abortion. On June 30th, 1984, 22 year old Mary Kay Schmitz marries Steve Letourneau in Washington DC. It's a traditional Catholic ceremony. The guests are mostly close friends and relatives of the bride who by now is four months pregnant. She went through the whole thing you know as a happy bride but she was miserable. In October 1984, Stephen Jr. is born. The young family moves to Seattle to be closer to Steve's family. Mary Kay maintains contact with her parents and siblings, but family visits are rare. Steve works double shifts as a baggage handler for Alaska Airlines, while Mary Kay stays at home with the baby. Two and a half years later, a second child, Mary Claire, arrives. The family finances are strained even further. They were threadbare. They didn't have a lot of money, and she made very well do with what they had. The financially beleaguered Letourneau household gets little help from the Schmitz family. But in 1989, Mary Kay is finally able to contribute to the household. She obtains her teaching certificate and is hired as a second grade teacher at Shorewood Elementary School in a Seattle suburb. The 27-year-old wife and mother of two has finally found a place to make her mark. She was not out to set the world on fire, but just her little corner. And not even set it on fire, just kind of get it smoldering a little. Coming up, the chain of events that will turn Mary Kay Latorno into a convicted rapist. All these things were spiraling and they were all converging and there was somebody there to pick up the pieces, and that was a 13-year-old boy. This is Headliners and Legends with Matt Lauer. In the summer of 1996, Mary Kay Letourneau is married to a man she doesn't love, and her father, the only man she ever did love, has been diagnosed with cancer that she believes will soon take his life. Now, close observers say Letourneau's husband was unable to comfort her, and something snapped. She seemed to regress into a childlike world, a world that included very adult behavior with a former student. It's hard to look back at the whole the progress of the relationship and pinpoint a time where I could have made a different decision we just had this hugging and kiss, kissing relationship going on. His friends say he was 
certainly know Romeo, but he came across to Mary as much more experienced than he was. A few weeks after Vili Falau's graduation from sixth grade, he and his teacher, Mary Kay Letourneau, are watching a movie at her house. Her husband, Steve Letourneau, is working, and their four children are all in bed. Vili and Mary Kay begin to hug and kiss. Mary Kay tells the boy that they should stop, but they don't. They consummate their relationship. All that matters was that we loved each other. Mary Kay is 34 years old. Vili is a few days away from his 13th birthday. She described sort of being taken by this um, powerful personality and, and feeling compelled to follow him where he was leading this relationship and that it was really out of her own hands. It wasn't really based on sex for her. It was based on this ideal man who happened to be 12 or 13. Mary Kay says that Vili is an artist, a genius whom she will nurture, and she believes that she has found a man who is as noble as her father once seemed to her. In my heart and in my mind, he wasn't an age. I think when we have close relationships with people, we value the relationship for completely outside of what's, what someone's age is. Mary Kay's four children, all under 12 years old, become aware that there is something different about their mother's relationship with Billy. They knew that Billy was around the house too much and they knew something was going on and some of them said, you know, later that they saw, you know, things in the house that indicated that Billy and their mother, you know, that was sex was going on and all this kind of thing. And while her husband spends less time at home, Mary Kay becomes more enmeshed in her fantasy. I felt that I very much needed the relationship. I also felt that he needed the relationship. Her urge was to keep herself tied to Vili as much as she could, and, and I have no doubt that sex played a, a large role in that. She wanted to get pregnant. I mean, she wanted that lifetime bond. And late that summer, Mary Kay does secure Vili's attachment to her. She is pregnant with the boy's child. Despite the explaining she will eventually have to do, she exults in her pregnancy and begins to plan a future with Billy. She wasn't thinking rationally at that point because she was thinking that, well, Steve will move away and Billy will move in and we'll all be together. There are signs at this point that Mary Kay is unable to distinguish fantasy from reality. She is elated and enraptured, almost to a delusional st uh, extent, about this boy. She is not able to step back and reflect and say, this is going to get me in prison. Mary Kay's behavior has become too erratic for Steve to ignore. He searches through Mary Kay's things and finds love notes, poems, and journal entries. Shocked and angry, he confronts Billy. I told him that uh, Mrs. Letourneau was in great trouble. He was also. I wanted to know one thing. I said I had found journals. I know everything. And I want to know the truth right now. Billy responded to him like a man who was being protective of his woman and um, seemed willing to sort of take a stand against this much larger, much older adversary. Steve demands that Mary Kay and Billy stay away from each other, but they don't. Mary Kay believes she can justify the relationship because for her, her marriage is over. She's not in love with her husband. I had separated emotionally from the marriage uh, quite a time, quite a bit of time before, uh, before I felt, uh, before I recognized my relationship with that particular student. I was filled betrayed, big time, betrayed. We had created this family together. We made commitments thick or thin. I didn't believe at all that she would cross a certain line of no return. Mary Kay wants a divorce, but Steve doesn't want his children to go through that trauma. He demands that they at least keep up the facade of their marriage. He wanted her to have an abortion. Of course, she refused. Um, 
to do that. I think that she had this belief that um, she wanted this child. She had this great love and connection with this boy, and that the ultimate um, proof of that love and connection would be to have a child. Steve and Mary Kay are deadlocked, living together with Mary Kay pregnant by her student. Steve turns to his relatives for support. He told his family, and they all agreed to keep it quiet until they figured out what was going to be done. When Mary Kay returns to Shorewood Elementary that fall, she is evasive about her pregnancy. She tells colleagues that it is her baby, not Steve's. The months pass, and Mary Kay continues to press for a divorce, and Steve continues to refuse. But suddenly, the matter is taken out of their hands. A relative of Steve's breaks the family's silence and calls the authorities. Detective Pat Maley responds to the call. On February 26, 1997, she goes to Villy's Middle School to question him. He said that yes, it had been occurring and that, um, that she was pregnant. After her meeting with Villy, she goes to Shorewood Elementary, where she asks the principal to call Mary Kay out of a staff meeting. She informs her that she is under arrest. The very first thing she said was, who told? She wasn't upset, she wasn't crying. The response was just not one of remorse, more of rationalizing why she had this affair with this boy. I don't think she realized the whole idea that, you know, that in Washington State this would be classified as a rape. You know, rape of a child, you know, a felony. I don't think she understood that. I think she thought that it was a private matter that uh, she could maybe negotiate her way out of. Mary Kay is taken to the local precinct where after two hours of questioning, she is released pending formal charges against her. She goes home and waits to face the storm. Coming up, Mary Kay Letourneau loses everything for the boy she says she loves. Please help me. Help us. Help us all. On February 26, 1997, 35-year-old Mary Kay Letourneau, a mother of four and trusted elementary school teacher, is arrested for the rape of her former student, 13-year-old Billy Falau. She is immediately suspended from Shorewood School, where she has taught for eight years. Mary Kay faces public disgrace as news of her arrest appears in the local paper. Attorney David Gerke is shocked to discover that the woman he is reading about is his neighbor, Mary Kay. Assuming the allegations are false, he offers to defend her. I didn't even ask her if it's true or anything like that. I just said, it's very serious. Your teaching career is threatened. There's prison. Uh, these, even when they're false allegations, uh, the juries tend to believe the children, and it's a tough case to have. And uh, in the middle of that, she just sort of said, wait, wait, wait. It's true. And I about fell over. I, I just couldn't believe it. A court delays Mary Kay's trial date until she gives birth. But she is not allowed to be alone with children. Not Billy, not even her own. Steve wants to keep the kids out of reach of the local press. He moves in with friends and sends the children to Mary Kay's brothers and sisters on the East Coast. Mary Kay's parents keep a discreet distance. They never speak publicly in support of their daughter. These are public people who are used to being asked the hard question by reporters, you know, who've been on camera. And they don't come forward for the child that was, you know, that maybe needs it more than any they've ever had. Depressed and alone, Mary Kay turns to Villy and defies the court order forbidding her to see him. She would never invite me into the house, and, and I later found out that that was because Villy was in there. And, of course, she didn't want anybody to know. On May 29, 1997, Mary Kay gives birth to a healthy baby girl, Audrey Lokolani Falau. The authorities allow Mary Kay to take Audrey home with her, where she continues to wait for her arraignment. Mary contemplated going to trial. She wanted the world to know that she wasn't a criminal, that she was not a rapist. Um, and so sometimes she'd think, let's go to trial. 
Gerke believes that Mary Kay's only hope of avoiding prison is to ask the judge to place her in a state-sponsored sex offender treatment program. Mary Kay insists that she is not a child molester, that she has committed no crime. Then I'd say, well, the issue is not rape as you define it, Mary. It's rape of a child as the law defines it. You are guilty. They can prove it. Finally, she agrees to plead guilty and ask for treatment. Mary knew she was looking at a perhaps the rest of her productive life in prison or doing a treatment plan and being with her children. And it was a real easy decision when presented that way. But Mary Kay has already lost her children. She learns they are being flown back from Washington, D.C. to Seattle, where they will be met by Steve. He is planning to move them to Alaska. Mary Kay finds out they will arrive on August 6th, and she waits for them at the airport. She saw them for two hours at the airport as they changed planes, and um, it was, as you might imagine, a very emotional two hours. And Mary came over to our house right after that and uh, was about as bad as I've ever seen her because she knew the next morning she was going to go and plead guilty and get locked up. Excuse us, excuse us, excuse us, please. On the following day, August 7, 1997, she leaves baby Audrey with Billy's family and goes to court. By now, the story of Mary Kay Letourneau has become national news, and the media attends her hearing in full force. You understand that you have been charged with the crimes of rape of a child in the second degree, two counts. Do you understand that? Yes. Back to the phones we go. Let's talk. Mary Kay's guilty plea sparks a firestorm of controversy about how a woman convicted of rape should be treated. My opinion is that she definitely needs treatment. I'll say that there's a double standard here. Men rape, jail them forever. Women rape, give them a break. I just think that the boy's just flat out lucky. While public opinion rages, Mary Kay waits in jail for her sentencing hearing. David Gerke has her evaluated by psychiatrists. Mary Kay is diagnosed with bipolar disorder, the mental disease characterized by depression followed by bouts of manic energy. At least one of the psychiatrists who examines her believes that Mary Kay's symptoms have been triggered by events in her life. What happened with Mary is that she suffered a very severe depression over the, when she heard her father had a, a terminal cancer. And she, and she also had a miscarriage around that time and the marriage was on the rocks. Dr. Moore treated Mary Kay. She says the diagnosis explains the choices Mary Kay made throughout her relationship with Billy. They're not decisions. They're impulsively driven, high excitement, elated, delusionally enraptured acts. She cannot measure the consequences, not without medication. Mary Kay is put on a drug called Depakote to help stabilize her chemical and emotional imbalances. The drug seems to be working. Meanwhile, the lurid details of Mary Kay's crime are replayed time and again on the news. In a case that shocked a community, a Seattle school teacher is being sentenced to having a sexual relationship with a 13-year-old student of hers. Today, Mary Kay Letourneau will get the chance to say she's sorry in court. On November 14, 1997, a contrite Mary Kay arrives at court for sentencing. Steve waits to hear whether his wife will end up in prison or in therapy. She exploited him for her own needs, her own selfishness, and her inadequacies. I'm asking you to give her a chance. If you send her to prison, she doesn't have that chance. I did something that I had no right to do, morally or legally. It was wrong, and I am sorry. I give you my word that it will not happen again. Please, please help me. Help us, help us all. Mary Kay's tearful plea is granted. The court remands her to a treatment program for convicted sex offenders. On January 2nd, 1998, she is released from jail. She is required to register as a sex offender and begin an outpatient treatment program. And as the weeks pass, she begins to fade from the public eye. But not for long.
Next, within a month, Mary Kay Letourneau is back in the headlines. It's clear right away, this is Mary Kay Letourneau, she's done it again. In 1998, Mary Kay Letourneau is undergoing treatment in a Washington State sex offenders program, due in large part to her lawyer's efforts to keep her out of prison. But early on the morning of February 3rd, she loses her only hope of remaining free. At 3 a.m., police discover her parked under a street lamp with Billy in the car, a total violation of her probation. When she rolls down the window and they see her, they immediately know who she is. And when they look beside her in the seat next to her and see the teenage boy, they immediately know who he is. And it's clear right away, this is Mary Kay Letourneau, she's done it again. Billy watches while Mary Kay is arrested again. David Gerke sees her at King County Jail hours after her arrest. She was in a, sort of sitting there in a fetal position um, like an injured animal. Uh, it, was, it was really sad. And uh, she kept saying, oh, well, you know, you, know, you got to get me out. You know, this isn't fair. I don't want to be here. Did you say hi to Chris and Dana? They brought you a banana cream pie. Three days later, she's back in front of the judge. She knew she was going to prison. She knew her life and her hopes and her goals and her ambitions were all shattered. These violations are extraordinarily egregious and profoundly disturbing. This case is not about a flawed system. It is about an opportunity that you foolishly squandered. Mary Kay loses everything she hoped to hang on to, including her children. It will be years before she sees them again. Steve bears witness to his family's pain. My children, my littlest, she says, when, you know, how come mommy went bye-bye? You know, what do you say? Mary, let's turn on Mary. Do you have any... We don't know when you get out. Clear the way. The press starts looking into Mary Kay's background, publishing some of the details of Mary Kay's childhood, including the downfall of her conservative Catholic father. The similarity between their behavior is uncanny. In the end, what does she do? She ends up doing exactly what her father did. She has an affair with a student. Mary Kay is sentenced to seven years in prison, but she still insists that she was never guilty of rape. In fact, Mary Kay believes that infidelity is her only offense. It was wrong. The extramarital part was very wrong. And then comes more explosive news. March 1998, David Gerke announces that Mary Kay is pregnant again with Billy's second child. She has authorized me to confirm that she is in fact pregnant. Even Billy is surprised, and this time he feels betrayed. I think Mary intentionally deceived him she told him that she wasn't going to get pregnant. He wasn't looking to be a father times two. He, you know, he, he was dealing already with being a father at 13. Billy is already raising their first child with the help of his mother. Meanwhile, the media clamors for the country's most infamous teenage father, who'd been unidentified until now, to reveal his identity. Finally, on May 5, 1998, in exchange for $50,000, Billy comes out of the shadows and does a tell-all interview with a tabloid newspaper, The Globe. Then, he and Mary Kay write a book, The Only Crime, Love. It is published in France. You shouldn't be punished for being in love with me. It's hard for me. We can't have any contact. We can't speak to each other, talk to each other. Can't even write letters. On October 16, 1998, while Billy is in Paris promoting their book, Mary Kay gives birth to their second child, Georgia Alexis. The baby is taken away from Mary Kay only hours after birth and sent to live with Billy and his mother. Mary Kay, left alone in prison, continues to pine for her teenage lover, still not believing that they ever should have been separated. Mary Kay still wants what she said she wanted from the very beginning, to have a life with Billy Folau and their children. But out in the world, 17-year-old Billy seems to be moving on with his life. He's dated girls his own age. Um, he's quite popular with girls. Um, they know him, having seen him in some tabloid magazines and on TV. I mean, you know, he's pretty recognizable. 
I can't really say, like, I'm for sure I'm going to get back with her. If I ever see her again, we're going to have a lot of talking to do before we do anything else. Mary Kay's father, John Schmitz, dies on January 10, 2001. Her four children, with husband Steve Letourneau, travel to Washington, D.C. for the funeral. On their way home to Alaska, they stop in Seattle to visit their mother for the first time since August of 1997. Mary Kay is expected to be released in 2004. The end of her bizarre love story remains to be written, and her faith in true love remains strong. It is true, it is real, and it was love, and it is love. Is it the kind of love, um, is there any space for that in our society? Maybe not. Vili Fulau and his mother have filed a $1 million lawsuit against the school system. They charge that officials were negligent in allowing a sexual relationship to develop between the boy and his teacher. Now, Mary Kay reportedly believes that Vili still loves her and that the suit is just a legal ploy to get money to support his family and their two daughters. I'm Matt Lauer. Thanks for watching.